How many of you had a great Christmas? Say amen. amen. How many of you got everything your heart desired? Say amen. amen. My wife got me a high-powered Nerf gun so my boys have <laughs> no chance, and I am so excited to use it. We do a big Nerf war, and, and the boys typically try to give me something that doesn't work well. And uh, I have my own now, and so I am really excited about being able to inflict all kind of Nerf pain on my sons in Jesus name. And so, uh, no, I'm excited. We, 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 we're, we're excited about it. We had a great time. Our family had a great time being together and, and celebrating the birth of Jesus, but celebrating with one another. Uh, it was just a great time. Always, a, a it's always a special time when you can have those moments with your family. And so and we had that and uh, we've enjoyed it. I pray that you have been blessed. I, I really, this week, as I began to think through where I was going to go and, and what God was leading, I, I, I really asked God, I was like, okay, God, so it's the last Sunday of 2020. It's the last time we're going to be together as a body in 2020. And so, Lord, I want to I want to preach a sermon on on turning the page. I want to preach a sermon on on moving forward. And I was like, Revelation chapter three, behold, you stands an open door. Let's go there. And God said, now, now. I'm like, okay, I, I just don't want to do, you know, uh, overcoming your fears because, man, we've heard that sermon a million times in 2020, and I don't want to do that one. He's like, no, we're not going to do that one. I'm like, okay. All right, so finally I got to the place, God, what, what do you want me to talk about? Where do you want me to go? And end up going back to a sermon that I preached at the beginning of 2020. And I pray that you're okay with that, and if not, I'm going to preach it anyway. Uh, and, and, but be, I think that, uh, I, th- I think that there are going to, there's going to be somebody here. There's going to be somebody watching online that, uh, maybe needs this today. How many of you know what a stronghold is in your life? They can be defined a lot of ways. Um, but the enemy, how he builds strongholds in your life is really very clear. They typically start when a, when a hurt has occurred, I hope, has everybody heard the phrase, hurt people, hurt people? Um, that, that's kind of the, the whole MO of building a stronghold in your life or something that has you bound. We sometimes will think about, well, you know, this is, I, I messed up today. Well, I'm not talking about the moments that you mess up where you stub your toe and say something you shouldn't and then you move on from that. And I'm talking about a stronghold, something that has you bound. You maybe have seen this where there's, there's a, a alcoholism and you struggle with that and it has you bound. There's an addiction that has you bound. There's an attitude that has you bound. And, and these strongholds are things that you deal with heavily. And, and whether it's those things or maybe it's something a little more subtle, it's insecurity that has you bound. It's, it's different things that no one knows about that have you bound. They all start from the same place. Something happened to you or, or there was a sin that occurred and then there was a reaction to it and the enemy caught it and he said, now that's what I'm going to build on. And he began to put things in front of you. I don't believe the enemy has the ability to control your mind. What I do believe is the ability, he has the ability to put things in front of you that you will step right into. Uh, people go, well, the devil tempted me. Well, no, what the devil did was he put the temptation in front of you and then you chose to either go into the temptation or push it away. Okay, so we we got to get real careful that we don't just throw all the blame on somebody else. We, we have choices that we make. And so strongholds are choices that we have made. They're just a lifetime of choices that we have made that have us now bound and kind of tied up in this stronghold. And we, we see this throughout time. We, you know different people that it seems like they keep making the same mistake and, and, and they have these different moments that happen in their life. And uh, you, maybe you know see people like this in relationships. It seems like they always pick the same type of person, just a different package, same type of person. They're, they're verbally abusive. They're manipulative. They're these things or that thing and you go wait a minute why why don't you get out of that well the some of the reason they don't get out of it because the only person they know how to relate to in a relationship is that person so if I get out of it with this person guess who the next one's going to be it's going to be that person in a different package and these strongholds have it some of you it's not a relational stronghold it's a financial stronghold and it's just this poverty mentality this is just the way it's supposed to be I'm always going to be broke I never am going to do anything I'm not going to amount to anything so what's the point of saving anything And so there's that poverty mentality, that poverty stronghold that says, you know what, I'm just going to stay right here. I guess this is what I got. 
We're going to get into some strongholds and what causes them here in just a minute. But I want to just kind of walk through this. We buy into the lies that the enemy tells us. We buy into them at a level that it ends up just, again, brick by brick, becomes a stronghold. And once it becomes a stronghold, the enemy doesn't have to defend it well because you've just built it around yourself. He doesn't, he doesn't have to be there every day knocking on your door because we do enough knocking from the inside to drive ourselves crazy. And so it, it's kind of like this sideline that the enemy has the ability to put us on when he gets a stronghold built around us. I don't want any of you sitting on the sidelines going into 21. I don't want any of you sitting around going, well, if I didn't have this in my life, then I could go forward, which is exactly what a stronghold will do. Just about the time God, you say, well, Vince, I'm, I'm a believer. I'm a child of God. That's awesome. I'm glad you are. If you're a Christian here today, praise Jesus. I'm glad we're family. But the reality is you can be a Christian and still be surrounded by a stronghold. You can be a Christian and still have things that wad you up. And here's the problem with them is God has this purpose set out here for you that's amazing. And he has a plan and it's awesome. But you can live only to a portion of that plan because when you hit the wall of your stronghold, you go, oh, this is all I got. This is just who I am. And then you never experience the fullness that God has for your life. So I don't know who it is today that's going to need this. Maybe you're here today and go, this isn't me. Well, if it's not you, then be praying for whoever it is. All right? Whoever it is that may be next to you. Because I think there's somebody here. There were people in the first service that, that came and they, they came down and they're trying to just set these things down and be released from these things that have held them for so long. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians, if you have your Bible, that's where we're going to be. It's going to be on the screen if you want, but ridding yourself of strongholds requires intentionality. You, you, have, you have to. Listen, I don't, get to, I don't get to bust your stronghold down. Because, man, if I could and God would give me that ability, I'd carry sledgehammers with me everywhere. I just, just what I would do. But I don't have that ability. What I can do, what God has called me to do, is to equip you with the hammers to bust down the strongholds in your own life. But I don't get to swing them for you. I can say, here's what the word of God says about you. Here's what God says you can do in this situation. But you ultimately have to build up this intentionality in you that says, hey, I am no longer going to stay here. I'm going to go and do what God would have me go and do, which means I've got to bust through some walls in my life. So today, I pray if nothing else, there's at least one of you, just one more of you that will bust through some of the strongholds that the enemy has convinced you that you need in your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5 starts this way. It says, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and we teach them to obey Christ. We do not fight. Catch that. We do not fight like the world fights. This is a spiritual battle that's taking place inside your heart and inside your mind. I used to say, oh, man, I wish that every morning the devil would knock on my front door so I could punch him right in the face. Wouldn't that be easier? Like, wouldn't that be, I mean, because then at least he's right there. And, and man, if I could just throat punch him one time, I'd feel better about the day. But not all, we don't get that option because he he's not a front door kind of fighter. He's the dirtiest of them all. He, he's not going to square up on you. That's not how he fights. He's going to slink his way in. He's going to drop a bomb in your mind. And you're going to sit there all day and think about it and how you're not enough and how you'll never be enough and how all that you haven't accomplished is somebody else's fault because they did this to you back here and now this is who you are. And he don't have to come to your front door. And so we don't fight the way that we would like to fight. The Bible says we don't fight. This is not a human war. We are human, but this is not a human war we're fighting. This is a spiritual war that we're fighting. We need to be, rebe we need to be ready for it. We need to take th captive the thoughts that come into our mind. How many of you have had time? My dad used to tell me all the time I'd talk about temptation. He'd say, I'd say, Dad, I just, I just got tempted and I couldn't help it. He's like, no, 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 no. He said, being tempted is like a bird landing on your head. I'm like, what? He said, being tempted is like a bird landing on your head. He said, what would you do if the bird did, landed on your head? I said, I would knock it off. He said, well, when it comes to temptation, knock it off. He said, you can let it build a nest, but that's weird. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Especially now, you don't even got a lot to work with. 
It's not that funny. It's still not that funny. <laughs> but I, I have the opportunity, I have the ability within me through Christ to push away temptation. It's the same way when he says these rebellious thoughts, you've got to take them captive. You've got to be the one that tells them what to do, not them telling you what to do. And too often we get bound up and our strongholds won't allow us. So I'm going to give you four sources of strongholds. This is where they will start in your life. You say, Vince, I don't know if I got any. You may not, but if you do, this is one of these four things is going to be where it starts in your life. The first one is this, is generational patterns. How many of you ever heard of the phrase generational curses? Man, this got passed down. My dad's an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic. My kids are most likely going to be alcoholics. So what's the point? I grew up in a house of addiction. Everybody was addicted. That's just kind of how it was. And this got, got passed down. Okay, let's get off the obvious ones and we can go, you know what? My parents had short tempers. My dad had a fuse about that long. That's why I get angry all the time. No, you get angry all the time because you choose to get angry. Yeah, but you don't know they set me off. No, you went off. No one has the ability to set you off. That's you push and blame. Vince, you don't know what they did. I don't have to know what they did. The reality of it is you have the choice with that. You have the choice with it. The illustration is the true, truest illustration I've ever seen with this is, is that we know this, and I use this all the time because it's the most perfect illustration in regards to your anger. If you're in the middle of a knockdown, drag out, blow out, screaming match in your kitchen and your phone rings, all of a sudden... As if some miracle from heaven happens, you are losing your mind and your phone rings. You're like, hello? <laughs> yes. Yeah, we'd love to. We'd th sure, that's, yeah, we'll meet you there. Yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait. And then you shut the phone off. Rawr, you're back in. No, it's a choice you make. It's not because your dad was angry, your mom was angry. Now, listen, those things will have impact on you, but they don't get to make the choice for you. That those things will influence your choices. They will do that, but they don't get to make the ultimate choice for you. It's too often we go, well, that's just how it happens. We just keep doing the same thing because that's what we've seen done. No, 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 no. How many of you are thankful for the person that finally come up with two-ply toilet paper? Say amen. amen. That guy's a genius. You imagine being in the plant that day when he was like, wait a, wait a minute. What if we put two together and then light bulbs went off all over the house they were like oh, this is life changing but you know what they didn't do they didn't get satisfied doing the same thing over and over and over but these generational curses in your life is just exactly that instead of fighting against it instead of somebody standing up and saying in jesus name this doesn't keep going with me we go well this is what everybody expects of me because they did it and they did it and they did it and they did it, so I guess I must have to do it. And we don't fight against it. Why don't we ever hear about generational blessing? Why don't we hear about that? Why don't, why don't we bragging about that? You know, we've just been generationally blessed. My grandpa put God and Jesus before everything, and God blessed his house. And then my dad's family, he was blessed by God because he just said, you know what, no matter what we do, good or bad, we're going to give God all the glory. And you know what, just seems like every generation that comes along, we just have this where we just keep giving God the credit, and we're blessed. No, we don't have that, do we? You don't have that. You don't hear about that conversation on Dr. Phil. No, we're not talking about that one. We're talking about the busted ones, the broken ones, the, those, those things that we just pass on and we pass on. Stop passing it on. Build something different in your life. Let that stronghold of what everybody else has said because of what you were or your family was the Bible actually says that the sins of the father will be visited to the third and the fourth generation. You say, see, Vince, that's unfair. Why would God visit the, the third and fourth generation with the sins of the father? No, what he's saying is that the effect, the sin effect that happened back here will still influence what happens up here unless you do something different. Make a different choice. Go a different way. Say no when everyone else said yes. And change that in your life. Change it. Second one is this. It's lies you have believed. There are a lot of lies we believe. We believe people's definition of us. 
We believe the world's definition of us. We will believe false definitions of God. We will believe false things that someone says about the Bible over actually looking in the Bible. We believe tons and tons of lies that are just thrown out there because we don't take the time to check. The Lord works in mysterious ways. No, he doesn't. He works exactly like he said he would work in the Bible. Nowhere in your Bible does it say the Lord works in mysterious ways. If it did, we'd all whisper when we read that verse, wouldn't we? The Lord works in mysterious ways. It doesn't say that. Jennifer and I were in a church one time. We were at a fellowship dinner. We were walking through the fellowship line. This lady walks up. She says, well, I've just always heard the good book says you don't throw rocks at people that live in glass houses. The what? The good book? Is that a different book? Because I have not read the good book if it says that. The Bible does not say anything about rocks and glass houses. Cleanliness is next to godliness. That's not in there. Thank goodness, huh? Yeah, John the Baptist would be out of luck because that dude was wild. The demon-possessed man that was sit on the island said he'd been living in the caves for years because he was possessed. And God went right up next to him and he was filthy. It's not in there. We believe those lies. You know what other lies you believe? Because this is your past, you'll never be anything more. Because this is a choice you made. This was a decision. This was a mistake. This was a sin that you walked in for a season, and you will always be that. You're an abuser because you have always been an abuser. You're an addict because you've always been an addict. You're this because you've always been this. You know what I heard about so-and-so, and we hear about that, and then we go, well, that must be who they are. And you believe the lies, and every lie, brick by brick, you build this thing. And eventually, you know what? You stop fighting against it because what's the point? Everybody believes this about me. That's what the enemy convinces you to think is that everybody believes it about you. How many of you know the truth behind the statement, no one always or nevers? Those broad statements of you always do this or you never do that. Those are broad statements that are absolutely not true. Same thing when people go, well, everybody does this. No, everybody doesn't do that. Everybody thinks this about me. Everybody doesn't think that about you. But the enemy will convince you that everybody does, so then what's the point of you fighting against it? The lies that people say about you, the lies that you believe about you. And so often we take those lies and we carry them with us. We just drag them along with us because that's just what, that's how we've been defined. The problem with the definition is that the only person that gets to define you is the creator. Who created you is the one who defines you. And he created you, and since he created you, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, I want you to look at the person next to you and say, you are peculiar. Come on, say it out loud to him. You are peculiar. Now, see, culturally, in our day and age, when you look at somebody next to you and you say, you are peculiar, it almost comes across like you're going, you are odd. You're weird. Am I right? That's kind of what it feels like. I don't know who you were looking at. Um, but like there's a part of you that says you are peculiar and you go, well, what I understand that word to mean is that I am, I am odd. I'm, I'm just a bit off. I'm weird. Peculiar. You know, just like not normal. Not normal. Yeah. <laughs> the biblical word found in the book of Peter he says, for you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. It doesn't mean weird. The word peculiar in the Greek means you have been purchased and bought for a purpose. Ah, oh, that's different. That's a different definition. That's one I like. Because when the world tells me I'm a little off, the world tells me my past is broken, the world tells me all these lies about myself, I can go to the writer of the book and say, God defined me as someone who has been bought for a reason. I have been purchased by the blood of Christ to fulfill the purpose of Christ in my life. 
That's the truth. Not because I want it to be, not because I deserve it to be, because God said it is, and that's what I have to begin leaning on. And when I can go to the truth of what God's word says about me, that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, that I am beautiful in the sight of God, that I can be strong and have good courage because he was with me and he'll never leave me. When I start believing those definitions of me, then I have no room to believe the lies of the world, no matter how bad they try. And they will try. How many of you know people just won't let you let go of what was behind you? It isn't their call. Unless you hand them the keys and then they'll walk in and tell you all the things you're not. So don't be surprised when people won't let you let it go when you keep inviting them in to tell you all that you were. It's a scary thing, church. Church. To live defined as something different. But it's also what we're required to do. We should be living something different. And instead you've bought into the lie. That you're not enough. Your worth and your value is based on the people around you. That's a lie. That's a lie. Because the reality of that lie is then that I need these people around me to make me feel fulfilled and complete. You are not Jerry Maguire. You don't need another person to complete you. Jesus Christ completed you. And that's enough. I love my wife more than anything. I love my wife. My wife loves me more than anything. But the reality is, is my fulfillment comes in Christ. And she is a blessing of that. Not the proponent. Not, she's not the reason that I am fulfilled. Not the reason I am complete. No, if that's what we do, then we put too much weight on the other people in our life because of lies we've believed. Third thing is this. The source of a stronghold is unforgiveness. These last two I'm going to be able to hang out for, on a, for a while because they are hard. They're not easy. If you're still nursing bitterness against someone or a person, the enemy will take advantage of that and keep you in your box. I know. I don't know what they did to you. I don't. But I know it was awful. I know you, you probably didn't deserve it. And they probably don't deserve forgiveness in your mind. But we don't give forgiveness because they deserve it or else we would have completely missed out on Christ. We give forgiveness because Christ forgave us when we didn't deserve it. We also give forgiveness because it sets us free from the bondage that we've put ourselves in. See, the reality is forgiveness, it's all one-sided. Well, as soon as they come to me and ask for forgiveness, I'll give it to them. Stop being prideful. As soon as they realize their fault and that they were wrong, then I'll forgive them. They won't. Chances are they're not even thinking about you right now. Well, that's kind of harsh. It's kind of real. It's kind of real. And it's time that you went ahead and moved on from that. Vince, not that easy. How dare you say I should just move on? I didn't say it was going to be easy. I, I, I don't want you thinking that I'm ignorant to the fact that years of pain that you've held on to, we're going to walk through it today in 40 minutes and you're out. No, this is a walk that you have to take to go, you know what? I don't want my life to become bitter over something the other person isn't even thinking about. And that's what will happen. When we live in this place of unforgiveness, when we live in this place where we carry the load that no one else is carrying with us, you isolate, you become very lonely because no one understands how you feel and you can't believe why they are over it and while they're moving on, why don't they think about it? Why don't they talk about it anymore? And you may even move to the place where you don't think or talk about it anymore until you're by yourself staring at your ceiling and you start to feel sorry and then you feel sorry, but it's their fault you feel sorry for yourself because of what they did. It's time. 
I don't know what goals and plans you have for the year coming up. I don't know what goals and plans you have to go forward. But what I will tell you is you are not experiencing this purchased for a purpose, this being bought by the blood of Jesus. You're not experiencing it to its fullness because you keep hitting this stronghold of unforgiveness in your life. And you're living just shy of the full blessing of God, the fullness of who he is. But too often, that's where we stay. And we as even believers, we go, good enough. I got some stuff that I'm working through, but this is good enough. I've got some issues that I have, but this is good enough. And what I want to tell you is that God has a bigger plan for you, but you've got to walk through some of the stuff. Remember, uh, these strongholds, to break them, it's intentionality. You've got to actually step into the fight a little bit and go, I'm going to pick up the hammer. I've got it right here. God tells me in his word that I can, I can be an overcomer. In fact, it says I can be more than an overcomer. But if I'm going to be more than an overcomer, I'm going to have to swing the hammer at the wall that keeps me from walking forward. But Vince, you don't understand the wall. A wall is a wall. Don't overcomplicate it with the details. I'm not, please understand, here in a minute I'm going to give you a remedy. And it's going to be a very simple remedy. It's just not going to be an easy one. How many of you understand that there's a difference between simple and easy? Say amen. There are people in our church that take weightlifting very seriously. And weightlifting in and of itself is pretty simple. You pick it up, you put it down. Now there's technique involved and, and I understand that, but the basics, you pick it up and you put it down. How many of you know that depending on the weight, the ease changes? For some of you right now in your life, it's not going to be easy because the weight of what you've had for so long is pretty heavy. And it's going to take work. But you need to move to this place of unforgiveness. The last source of a stronghold before I give you the remedy is unconfessed sin. You know what I'm talking about, right? You know, this, the back of the mind stuff, the back closet of your heart, stuff we don't, you don't talk about, you don't share with, but you think about it, it's there. And I don't know what it is. I won't make any assumptions. And, and please, in your mind, don't make any assumptions because you have one. There's probably something there that you've held on to that is yours and you haven't even brought it to God. Now, here's the problem with that is because God is a God who says, you know what, I am able. How many of you believe that the cross of Jesus Christ is able to forgive you of your sin no matter what? Say amen. Now, if you believe that and you said amen, then I need to ask you a very firm question, and I'm going to kind of get right in your plate a little bit about this. Then why, if he is able to forgive it, why haven't you let him? He's just amen saying, yep, yeah, I know the cross is able. Then why not put it there and let him take it? Why not allow him to take that sin that you've not confessed? Why not allow him to take that pain that you're continuing to carry with you? Why not allow him to take that and do something radically new in your life rather than keep dragging around the old stuff that just makes you feel good because this is easy. I know what this is. This is comfortable for me dragging around my old sin and my old junk and all this stuff. I can carry it and nobody knows. Let me just kind of set you free. You're not hiding anything. You may be hiding the detail, but the pain is still there and it's noticeable. The struggle is still there and it's noticeable. I believe God can heal anything. What I also know about God is God is not able to heal it unless you release it. See, Vince, that's blasphemous. God, God can't heal it if I don't know. Yeah. Here's what God is. God is everything. God has the ability and the power to take all of your sin away. Scripture tells us that. That's the kind of God he is. But God has also set himself up to be a gentleman. The Bible says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. That's what he, Jesus says. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone would open the door and invite me to come in, then I will come in and I will sup with him. Some of you are waiting for God to kick down your unforgiveness. You're waiting for God to come down and kick down your unconfessed sin. And he's been standing there for seasons in your life going, 
If you will open the door, I can get rid of this stuff for you. And you won't. Because you know how to live in the pain. You just don't know how to live free. You don't know how to live purchased with a purpose. You don't know how to live in the will of God. You don't know how to do that. Why? Because I've just stayed in the stronghold. I moved from one to the other to the other. I moved from unforgiveness to my unconfessed sin to the lies people said about me to the generational curses. And I just bounced back and forth between these four boxes. And that's kind of where I stay. Actually, it's kind of all big, one big box now. They're all mixed together. I don't know what to believe. Here's what you can believe. That God sent his son and he bought you with his blood so that you would not have to be what this world defined you as. Your worth, your value was decided not because somebody said you're good enough or somebody said I like you or somebody said, man, what a great thing you've done in this life. No, your worth and your value were decided because Jesus went to a cross that was meant for you. That's how important you are. That's how valuable you are in heaven is that the Son of God took your place. And yet we still chase after someone else approving us, believing in us, and we start to lay another brick in another stronghold. So Vince, what's the remedy? What, how do we fix it? Uh, it's pretty simple. Here's what it says about Jesus in Colossians. It says, you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ. For he forgave all of our sin. He forgave all of our sin. He canceled the record of the charges against us and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. That's what Jesus has done to your sin. That's what Jesus has done to your past. That's what Jesus has done with everything that you continue to carry into this purposed future that you see but you can't experience. He took it away. And we love to talk about it. We just struggle living it. We, we know the Sunday school answers. Is Jesus able to forgive? Yes, he is. Is he able to forgive you? Yes. You live like you're forgiven. Not so much. I still wonder if God can use me in a, in a big way. I still wonder if I'm, I'm worth the time, I still, I, I don't know. Then Jesus in the book of Luke says this. If any of you wants to be my follower, any of you wants to be my follower, here's the plan. Give up your own way. Okay? Okay? That's surrender. Surrender. Give up your own way. Well, Vince, I'm, I know. I'm supposed to come and ask Jesus to come into my heart. And say, God, you're, you're the Savior. I'm the sinner, and I need you in my life. Okay. Salvation takes surrender, but the Christian life daily takes surrender. You daily give it up. You daily lay aside your wishes, your dreams. I was joking in the first service, we had some people in our church that moved to St. Croix Islands down in the, and man, they were like, hey, we want a real life church there. And I think that's an awesome idea. I'm going to go be the pastor there for six months and come be the pastor here for six months. No, nah, I'm not going anywhere. Because I know what God's plan for me is. And way back when I said, God, if you want me to preach, I will preach. At that moment, I surrendered and I said, Lord, whatever you want to do with me, you do with me. I had to surrender my way. I wonder in your life, have you surrendered your way? Or have you just kind of surrendered the whole, I hope I get into heaven part of your life? And the rest of your life, you're still kind of hanging on to pieces of it instead of surrendering it and saying, God, I want you to have my marriage. I want you to have my kids. I want you to have my finances. I want you to have all of my life. 
I want you to have the decisions I make. I want you to have my friendships and my relationships. I want you to have those too so that I am completely surrendered to you. Vince, you're telling me not to have friends? No, I'm telling you to have friends. I want you to have friends. I don't want you to have people that are going to bail on you in the moment. I want you to have godly friends, that their counsel to you is the word of God, not the next best thing they heard. So I want you to have all those things, but it only happens through surrender. Saying, Lord, this is no longer my life, it's your life. Surrender. The next thing he says is to take up your cross daily. This is an actionable step. So here's the remedy. I'm giving it to you. The first one is surrender. The second part of that is actionable steps of faith. You got to pick something up. You got to do something. It's one thing I could sit here and go, you know what? I'm a preacher, but if I never preach, then all I've done is surrender to something that no one believes because I haven't put foot, feet to it. So as in your life, you want to break through strongholds? Yes, God may give you a hammer. Yes, God may go, yeah. And you may go, you know what? I'm ready to defeat this stronghold. I'm ready to do it. Well, then it's time for you to stand up, pick up the hammer, and swing it at the wall. Take action against it. Be intentional. Say, you know what? You may believe that about me, but I know better, and God knows better. I'm out. You may want to talk that about me, and that's fine. But listen, don't put yourself in a position where those things can be believed about you. We default so quickly to pain and insecurity and discomfort. We default there. I'll just go to what makes me feel comfortable. And we know it's not of God. We know it's not what he's asking us to do, but it's more comfortable because we've been here before. Peter would have never walked on water had he been worried about being there before. Moses never would have parted the Red Sea if he'd have stepped into it and goes, you know, I've never parted seas before. No, you've got to be willing to step into something new. And that new may just be a new definition of you, but step into it. And then, man, whatever it is, you, you own it. I tell Dallas all the time with the worship team, whoever's singing that song, they better sing it like they wrote it. I want them to own what it is. I don't want them to be timid. I don't want them to be wondering if it's okay. I want you to sing it like you wrote it. Folks, in your life, you need to live the life like God gave it to you. And he did. Surrender. Actionable faith steps. Do something with it and then follow through. Just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. At the end of the verse, he says, follow me. Surrender your life. Pick up your cross daily and follow where I go. Follow where I go. This morning, church, I want you to think for a moment. I want to ask you. Some of you right now, it's generational curses. It's lies you've believed. It's unforgiveness or it's unconfessed sin. Those things are holding you back. They're keeping you from water walking. They're keeping you from seas parting in your life. They're keeping you from the next thing that God wants to show you. So why not stop today? Why not swing the hammer today? By saying, God, I surrender. I don't care what the world says about me. I'm going to follow you. I don't care what my followers say. I don't care what people think. I'm going to follow you. God has been messing with me for about a year on that thought. That God, I quit chasing achievement and I only seek obedience. I don't need anything else in this life. I'm healthy. My kids are healthy. My wife is healthy. We're good. I don't, I don't need to win anymore because I've come to the realization that when it's all over I win anyway guy stopped me yesterday he said man it's cold today I said it's or not yesterday it was Friday I said, or Thursday before Christmas I said it is cold Whew, I don't know if it's going to be a good day or not a good day I said man any day breathing is a good day and he stood straight up and he stopped and he looked at me and went huh. and I thought it wasn't like rocket science I'm breathing it's good. 
God has just got me to this place where I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm good. God has blessed me. Achievement, it goes away when he comes back anyway. Obedience will last forever. What are you chasing? You chasing anything or are you stuck in a stronghold? I want you to bow with me, church. And for just a little bit, I want you and God to talk. Just you and God. I believe this is a sermon you have to do something with. You have to surrender or you hang on to it. You have to make an actionable move. You have have to step. Or you stay where you've been. And where you've been ain't been working. You know that. That's not a lesson I have to teach you, but there's some unforgiveness in some of you right now that, that is holding you back. And if it is, you need to come on. You don't need to wait for me. You need to move. There's generational things that have been attached to you year after year after year after definition after person going, well, I knew your daddy or I knew your mom and doesn't surprise me a bit. This is where you're at. No, 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 no. This is the day you stop that and you go, you know what? Regardless of who they were, I know whose I am and his name is Jesus. And you break that generational curse and you start a generational blessing today. Come on. Come on. For some of you, it's unconfessed sin. There's stuff there that's in your heart. Vince, if I move, everybody's going to know. What does it matter? It's holding you back from the purpose that God has in your life. It's holding you back from the joy that God wants to pour out on you. It's holding you back. Come on. Do something different today. Change it. Change that today. Let's change the definition of the lies people have told about you. You say, Vince, they weren't lies. I really was that person. But you're not now. Don't let a 10-year-ago definition be who you are right now. That's not right. We don't do that to anything else. Things change. You change. God has changed you. Stop living under the definition 10 years ago gave you, 20 years ago gave you. And you be who God made you to be right now, today. You set it aside. You say, God, I'm putting this on the altar, and I'm not picking it up. I'm going to be a child of God. I'm going to be a son or a daughter of the king. That's who I am when I leave this place. I'm not the one that got around. I'm not the one that messed up the marriage. I'm not the one that left my kids. I'm not that anymore. I am who you say I am today it starts some more of you need to break through the stronghold you need to take a step and you're not going to get through it if you don't step towards it you're not going to get through it unless you step towards it come on come on past events I want to be different but man it's so hard to be different. Yeah, it's not easy, but it's simple. People will walk with you. People will walk with you. Come on. Come on, you're not going to be alone. There's people already up here praying. You're not going to be by yourself. Come on. Take a step. Don't, don't, don't go home with it. Don't, don't leave this building where God made an appointment for you to be here. You're not here by, you didn't stumble in. God made an appointment for you to be here. Set it up for the Spirit to speak to your heart right now. You can tell you're getting wrecked in your soul right now. And he set that up. And today is the day that you get to move on it. Come on. Come on, I'll stay as long as the Spirit moves. Come on. You got something broken in you that God can't fix, that only God can fix? Come on, let him fix it. Walk through the stronghold today. Come out on the other side, being that peculiar person, the one that was bought for a reason, with a purpose that's set up in heaven, that this world can't contain what God has for you to do, but not until you step towards it. Take a step today.